Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Coco Khan. I'm Nish Kumar. And on today's show, we're saving the UK from knife crime. We'll meet the man who has £200 million burning a hole in his pocket. That's money he's got from the government to find out what works and to actually put it into practice. John Yates will tell us his plans and community worker and charity CEO Dr Marcellus Bass will tell us what he thinks of them. Plus, has anybody seen Boris Johnson's notebooks? Anyone? They're almost certainly filled with drawings of penises. So, Nish, how are you doing? I saw you uh, strolling into the studio with your Beyonce Uh-oh. cap on. Oh, <laughs> he's got it on. He's got it I'm on. I'm wearing my Beyonce cap. Yes, I saw Beyonce on Monday. Do, when you wear it, is it so that everyone knows you saw Beyonce? Yeah, if anything, it's too discreet. It just says Renaissance World Tour. I'd much rather it said I, I was saw in the Beyonce. presence of Beyonce. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I saw the succession finale and Beyonce within 24 hours of each other. Wow. It was a real, like, it, it, it was a day of culture Monday for me. Are you feeling really, you must feel sort of emotionally drained after all of well, that. Well, I, <laughs> I think the succession finale, without giving any way, uh, any spoilers, although if you've watched even a minute of the show, you'll know, Bit of a downer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a. It's brilliant TV, but it is not feel good stuff. Yeah. So in a way, it was perfect to have had that experience, and then in the evening see Beyonce uh, lift us back up. I, I don't need no. I don't need to sell the show to you. I, it's selling itself. But let me tell you, at one point, she flies around on a model horse. It is she literally amazing. flies around the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. It's amazing how everyone who has in some way touched, been touched by Beyonce, it is like hugely significant in their life. My other half, years and years ago, he was running a fashion magazine and at the time Beyonce was doing some fashion stuff. I think she had a perfume brand. And so as part of that, she was playing at Glastonbury and she took a bunch of like fashion journalists and fashion people to Glastonbury on her bus, on the front of the bus just said Beyonce. Oh and so God. whenever she would drive up to a gate, well, not her, obviously the driver would go up to a gate. Although I would, do like the idea that Beyonce <laughs> yeah, does her own yeah, driving. Yeah. They'd drive up to the gate and it would be like open sesame, but the word is Beyonce. And, that, <laughs> and the gate's just open. And that is, and he talks about that all the time. Lives have been touched, doors have been opened, doors of perception by it Beyonce. Was, listen, it was an extraordinary gig. I did cry when she sang River Deep Mountain High in tribute to Tina Turner. Yeah. She sort of opened with some piano ballads, which a friend of mine <laughs> described as basically making the old white people feel okay <laughs> before the big black gay disco began. Right, right, right. Uh, but yeah, it was a really amazing gig. And, you know, nice to see some happy faces in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium after at best a mixed season for the football club. <laughs> On to the big political story of this week. It involves some missing notebooks, a bunch of missing WhatsApp messages, some diaries, and inevitably, Boris Johnson, Britain's number one clown. It's pretty complicated, and considering it involves the uh, finest brains of Whitehall, it's surprisingly stupid too. (laughs) Here's what you need to know. So the COVID inquiry, which was set up by the government to investigate how the UK handled the pandemic, you know, trying to figure out what lessons we can learn, how can we be better prepared for the future. That inquiry wants access to Boris Johnson's COVID-related WhatsApp messages, wants uh, access to Boris's diaries, 24 notebooks, and it wants them unredacted. So it wants them without anything edited out or anything blacked out. At the Cabinet Office, which is the government department that works with the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, has pushed back on that. Uh, It reckoned a lot of the messages and notebooks weren't relevant and says it has no duty to disclose unambiguously irrelevant material. Now, Rishi Sunak wasn't giving much away when he was asked about it. Well, I think it's really important that we learn the lessons of COVID and that's why the inquiry was established and we want to make sure that whatever lessons there are to be learned are learned and we do that in a spirit of transparency and and candour. The government has cooperated with the inquiry. Tens of thousands of documents have been handed over and with regard to the specific question at the moment, the government's carefully considering its position but it's confident in the approach that it's taken. He said absolutely nothing of any consequence there. That was some weak school fair orange squash of a response like yeah, it yeah, was yeah. he didn't seem to have a huge amount of detail in it now I'm sure as you're listening to this if you're anything like us you're progressively losing the will to live so let's cut to the chase the head of the COVID inquiry Baroness Heather Hallett wants this stuff and she what she really wants is an explanation about what the fuck is going on which is not her words but 
it feels but like maybe it her captures words. the spirit <laughs> yeah. of it. Yeah, it feels like her internal monologue. And there's an element of, you know, maybe tell us what the fuck is going on. And she's asked the cabinet for a signed statement setting out what's happened, backed up by a statement of truth. Um, and, you know, Boris Johnson has form uh, when it comes to mucking around with baronesses because it was Baroness Hale that ruled against his attempt to prorogue Parliament. Uh, you know, you don't <laughs> fuck with a baroness. I don't even know really what a baroness means as a title, but clearly they're not to be trifled with. So the big question is, will the messages be handed over? If the government hold firm, expect it to apply for a judicial review and we will be suffering this endless torture for a while. It definitely makes you wonder, where is the phone? Where are the phones? Have they accidentally fallen into the North Sea in the style of Wagatha Christie? And what does it tell us about the way the government and justice system works? Which is a really long way of saying, hey Nish, how many phones do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one phone. Most of the time when I'm leaving my house, I'm in an absolute panic. Yeah. So if I had more than one phone, I genuinely don't know how drug dealers and philanderers do it. <laughs> Um, this is this is another mess, right? This is a, or I don't even know. If this is a new mess. This is the same mess rolling on and on. But just on a personal level, when I read about having your WhatsApp messages summoned by a baroness, I thought for a moment how I would feel if that happened to me, and that would feel very very bad. I if you summoned my WhatsApp messages now, you would lose total confidence in me. The last four conversations I had were genuinely about eels. <laughs> 100%. I'm not even lying. That's what has been on my mind the last few days has been eels. So I've been talking about it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I imagine Boris Johnson's are an absolute sewer of filth. But the concern with some of this is that the reason the notebooks and the WhatsApp messages are being redacted is that they're now also trying to protect members of the current government and Rishi Sunak. There is a really important issue at stake here, OK? And that the important thing is surely the inquiry and getting all of us big answers that we want about the pandemic. Just to remind you, the purpose of this, the stated purpose of this inquiry is to examine the UK's response to and impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and learn lessons for the future. It has powers to subpoena witnesses, require disclosure of evidence and hear testimony under oath. And there is also a separate inquiry for Scotland. There are serious mistakes made mm -hmm. and we need to learn from those mistakes. And the only way we can learn from those mistakes is by fully finding out what happened Absolutely. without having key bits of information redacted. For sure, for sure. We had one of the highest death rates in the G7. That is shameful. More than 127,000 deaths from COVID-19 happened on Johnson's Watch. That's people's lives, yeah. their families, communities scarred by that. Like we have questions they need to be answered and we need to be learning our lessons. It's guaranteed there will be another pandemic. That's a fact. That's just how diseases work. Yeah. So we need to be prepared and we need to learn something so that next time there's not such um, such a stain upon this nation, really. Yeah, there are absolute key questions here. How could we handle a future pandemic better? How were the decisions made? Why were people discharged from hospitals into care homes without proper COVID testing? And why did we record such high death rates, second only to the US out of the G7, for clarification? It, was our lockdown strategy flawed? Uh, where did all the money go? You know... We, eat out to help out as well. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely know. right. What was the impact of eat out to help out? The man who's now prime minister... Yeah presided over a policy that seemed to be we can cure COVID with Pizza Hut. I guarantee you somewhere in Boris's WhatsApps there will be a discussion of eat out to help out and all Bar Boris will be doing is making kind of English jokes. 100%. <laughs> that's the sort of guy he is. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, listen, there are serious questions that desperately need to be answered. And, you know, families that lost people during the COVID-19 pandemic have a right to know what happened. I think what I don't want to see from this inquiry is that we find out after over a kind of ordeal of time that, yes, mistakes were made. Sorry, like that's not good yeah. enough. There has to be actual consequences of it and there has to be apologies. There has to be funds. There has to be promises that it won't happen again. Um, and the issue, I suppose, that we're concerned about is that if it takes too long, the ability for the public to hold those responsible to account, you know, it just fades away because there's another crisis to think about. Yeah, and the thing that worries me about this is if, as they've announced this week, they're aiming to conclude their public hearings by summer of 2026, there's too much of a time delay. And the longer you allow these things to go, the less chance you have of any active consequence for any of the people responsible. The Iraq war inquiry was delayed and delayed and delayed. And by the time uh, it actually published its findings, most of the kind of principal parties had moved on into different jobs. 
Some of them have gone on to move into podcasting. But it is a concern that we want accountability and we want it to happen sooner rather than later. And if they need to take till summer 2026 because they want to do as thorough a job as possible, then that's great. But what we can't have is that deadline being pushed even further because the government are refusing to cooperate and give them the information that they need. You know, it's so interesting that you said that and you mentioned Iraq there. And actually, anyone who has actually been affected by it, they won't forget. They will never forget. And I think that's really just an important thing to say that for those that were impacted, this is lifelong. There is no amount of time that is too long to wait for answers. Really, it's just about how quickly can we serve justice? Because justice not served is no justice at all, really, isn't it, for the longer that it goes on? I absolutely agree with you 100%, Coco. Um, Coming up next, we're going to meet the man who's been given 200 million quid by the government to find the solution to youth knife crime. Pod Save the UK is brought to you by The Economist. If you're listening to this right now, you probably like to stay on top of things, which is why I want to mention our sponsor, The Economist. Today, the world seems to be moving faster than ever. Climate and economics, politics and culture, science and technology. Wherever you look, events are unfolding at pace. But now, for the first time, you can get a one-month free trial of The Economist so you won't miss a thing. I love The Economist, uh, not only because it helps broaden my perspective on everything that's going on in the world, but it's always deeply researched. They have some great experts providing analysis. It really allows me to hone in on issues that matter a lot to me. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the world these days, but with this free trial, you get access to in-depth, independent coverage of world events through podcasts, webinars, expert analysis, and even their extensive archives. So whether you want to catch up on current events or dive deeper into specific issues, The Economist delivers global perspectives with distinctive clarity. Uh, Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, I just pulled something that uh, was in the magazine this week that caught my eye. Uh, It's about how India's troubled banking sector is now generating huge profits. Very, very interesting. Go to economist.com slash podsave UK for full access to the topics that matter to you and original analysis as events unfold. That's economist.com slash podsave UK to start your one month three trial with The Economist today because the world won't wait. Let's try an experiment, Coco. If you type the words knife crime into a Google News search, what are some of the headlines from the last couple of days alone? Well, as it happens, Nish, I have done precisely that. Southampton teenager charged after Thornhill knife attack, machete and zombie hunting knife seized during a crackdown on knife crime in Wigan. Police see steep rise in people carrying knives in Norfolk. More than 350 knives recovered in Lancashire's West Division during knife crime crackdown and 70 knives seized in dozens arrested in knife crime crackdown across West Midlands. Okay, that paints a picture of a countrywide problem. Here are some stats. There were 282 murders involving a knife or sharp instrument in England and Wales in the 12 months to March last year, which is the highest total since 1946. 99 of those people were aged under 25. 13 of them were aged under 16. All in all, police in England and Wales recorded nearly 50,000 knife-related offences last year up to December. Now, what if I were to tell you that we already know what works to drastically reduce knife crime. You'd be quite right to ask, why aren't we doing it? Well, evidence shows that to get results, you need a combination of mentoring, therapy, family support, and policing in the areas where violence is high. It's a targeted interventionist approach that has been adapted from a US model used most famously in Boston in the mid-90s, where it led to what has been called the Boston ceasefire. Since then, it's been used in Glasgow, once known as the murder capital of Europe, where it's helped violent crime fall dramatically in the last 20 years, with murders falling by 90%. Well, we're thrilled to introduce you to John Yates, the chief executive of the Youth Endowment Fund, which is a £200 million, 10-year government-backed initiative focused on tackling youth crime by supporting early interventions for young people at risk. John, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, before we start having what is undoubtedly a very serious and important conversation, I have been given a very strange piece of information about you, and that is that you and I have something in common you were a stand-up comedian? Yeah, well, you still are, though, I believe, a stand-up comedian, where I definitely am in the past tense. <laughs> I, I don't know, John, there's a lot of people that don't consider what I do to be stand-up comedy. <laughs> there's a lot of people that believe my views on knife crime probably deserve to be, so, you know, snap. <laughs> uh, I was a very, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of my life setting up organisations that say you should fail fast. <laughs> 
I failed fast at stand-up comedy. When did you do stand-up? I, I did a, I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, 10 gigs. Uh, right, we're not okay. talking a large number. Enough to realise I'm not very good at this. <laughs> I, I told my friends I was going to do it and they laughed at me. You could probably work out the end of this gag. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I started doing it, that ended. And so I thought, maybe not for me. But it's one of those things like, you know, so people have that thing they always want to do and the yeah. thing I always wanted to do. And I did it. And I've done it, so I can stop. Yeah, you've done it. And it's, what's great about it is that you've moved on. I, I do sometimes, I know a lot of comedians, and I'm not including myself in this. I am, no one lost a cancer cure by me going into stand-up comedy. But I know some deeply smart stand-up comedians, and I often think, you really could be doing something better <laughs> for humanity. I think for the good of humanity, it's good that I do what I do, which is sort of broad new shouting. But it is good that you stepped away from stand-up comedy, because you're doing something I think... I would consider it to be much more worthwhile. I think definitely for my previous audiences, it's good I stepped away, and I hope it's good for wider society. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, so let's start with this headline figure, 200 million quid. Where's that money come from, and what's it What's it going to do? Yeah, so let me remember, thank you to everyone who ever paid taxes ever, and that is all of us. If you've ever bought anything, you've paid 5% VAT or something or something, thank you very much indeed. Um it, it's money given to the charity I lead to do a really simple thing, which is, wouldn't it be great if we actually knew what really did reduce knife crime? So we didn't just guess. We didn't just get politicians going, I quite fancy this new idea, or why don't we try this, or people writing opinion pieces in the newspaper, and then why don't we just use some science? So when it came to the pandemic, rather sensibly, someone said, why don't we test some vaccines rather than just give them to people? Yeah. Why don't we check if they work just in case they have a side effect? And, and so they ran tests. And that's what my charity does. We test things. So we'll fund different types of mentoring programs, different ways that police might act, different things that could happen in schools. But the aim isn't just to be a boffin. It's to actually, let's actually save lives. You know, 100 children lost their lives in this country over the last four years. I would like that to be closer to zero. And so let's work out what works. I think we now know a lot about what works. Yes. Yeah, so t tell us, I, I understand there is something of a, a method that's developed. Yeah, there's quite a few things. I mean, I wish there was like one magic silver bullet. There, there, there's not. But there's a number of things that are pre-silvery that we ought to be, <laughs> we ought to be doing more of. So um, the, the one of the ones uh, that I am really passionate about is a program that was done in Glasgow. It's worked in Glasgow, it's worked in Malmo, it's worked in Chicago, and those are just the places that rhyme. <laughs> uh, and, but it's not been properly tried here in England and Wales. And it's a really simple program. It's called Focused Deterrence. The only complicated thing is the name, Focused deterrence. And it's really simple. What you do is you work out who are the people who are most involved in violence in a city. And the thing about violence is it's really sticky. It tends to stick to a small number of people. It's right. not lots of people doing it. It's a small number of people. Who are those people? Then let's approach them. And to do that, the police need to work really closely with the community. Let's approach them and say, hey, would you like to change things? And most people involved in violence aren't having a great time. Their lives are not working well. Things are really pretty troubled. So then you make an offer and you say, would you like some support? And the way this was done in Glasgow is they brought a lot of young men in to a meeting and they came to the meeting and mothers spoke who had lost children at this meeting and said, this is what happened to my son. I would like things to change here. And a lot of those young men gulped and thought, I'd like something to change here. Yeah. And they were all given a little card of a number on and said, look, call this number if you want help. And people started to call the number. And then help was really genuinely provided. So people were given training, people were given therapy, people were given mentoring, people were helped with their housing, like proper serious help. Glasgow is so much safer. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. But Glasgow is so much safer now. And this programme was part of that answer. But we need it happening in more places. It's such an interesting holistic approach to dealing with knife crime. And I remember reading that one of the things that they tried to do was switch it from being a kind of criminal operation to treating it as a public health emergency. What does that mean in practical terms? Yeah. So people um, will often, who are really interested in this say, oh, it's great, we're going to take a public health approach. The only problem is no one really knows always what they mean by yeah. public health approach. Yeah. So what do, what do I mean? Oh, when I'm definitely like... guilty of someone <laughs> who said we need to take a public health approach repeatedly and not fully known what I meant by that. So... What what we really mean is that, um, first of all, violence is actually quite contagious. You can catch it. You were talking about right. the pandemic earlier. Um, if I'm a victim of violence, 
I'm more likely to be a perpetrator of violence. You know, you respond violently to a violent situation. So that's the first thing. A bit like public health, things are catchy. Right. The second thing is when someone's ill, you can give them some medicine, but a vaccine is even better. Get yeah. in early. So public health means, yes, we help people when they're really ill, but why don't we get in early as well? So a proper public health approach works out that people mix and they move around. So we've got to think about the dynamics in a city, but it also says get in early as well as late. The mistake, I would say, is just to get in early. Right, <laughs> we need right. to get in all the time, right? So we need to think most children who get involved in violence have suffered trauma quite early in their life. Let's get them therapy really early. Let's get them support to their parents. Let's get in early with that. A lot of children who commit violence have been arrested at least once. We mustn't write them off. <laughs> we need to get mentors and support in there. So it's early and late to do it right. But it's not just thinking we lock people up and it's done. Am I right in thinking, though, that the profile of people who involved with this particular kind of knife crime in Glasgow would be very different to, say, London or very different to Birmingham? How, how, how do you essentially customise this to those cities or, or to those communities? I think, the, I think um, the people who get involved in violence are very much like me and you. We're all pretty similar as humans. 99% of our DNA is the same, right? Um, but some pretty tough stuff tends to have happened to some of us. And so generally, uh, a lack of care and support and abuse uh, from uh, when you're very little, a society that feels like it doesn't care for you. And then the thing that most of all I'm struck by when I met people who've committed acts of violence is they feel like they don't matter. They feel like they have no mattering in society. And so that's pretty common in all the cities. Now, I'm not a big softy. I'm not saying, therefore, we just hug everyone and it's fine. Yeah. There need to be consequences. You can't just say, oh, I don't matter, therefore I'll commit an act of violence. There yeah. have to be consequences. But that's the commonality. But that, of course, I'm not trying to be na naive either. You know, London, drugs are a big part of the violence. They're yeah. not such a big part historically in Glasgow. Um, you can't be serious about thinking about violence in Glasgow without thinking about sectarianism. Yeah. You can't be serious about thinking about violence in London without thinking about race. Like There are different contexts, and that's why the community, which just means us, right, yeah. <laughs> need to be involved as we think this stuff through. But the people are people uh, and very similar. So I do want to bring in our next guest, but just very quickly, what are the five cities this is being trialled in? in yeah, so we're, we're going to be uh, making it happen in uh, Coventry, uh, Wolverhampton, Nottingham, Leicester and Manchester. Can I just ask why, the, why those were chosen? Yeah, so there are five areas um, where um, there are um, issues with uh, violence um, and there are people who want to make a difference. You, mm. you can't, my biggest plea is we kind of know what works what we need is adults to step up to try and make it happen. And in those places, people have stepped up and said, we want to make it happen. We know an adult who has also stepped up as well. Uh, perfect segue to that introduce... That was a genuinely brilliant that segue. That was great, wasn't I it? I was sat here being that like, was a man, that is broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. That is broadcasting. Seamless, seamless. <laughs> Glided along like a duck. Um, so please can we introduce uh, Dr. Marcellus Baz. He's the founder and CEO of Switch Up. It supports young people away from crime in Nottinghamshire, which is one of the places John's programme is running. Hello. I'm going to say Baz. Hello, guys. Uh, privileged to be on board and, uh, and thank you for having me. So I know you've been on a long journey yourself with both your organisation and just individually. I'd love to hear your story. How did you get into this line of work? Yeah, I, you know, I was one of those young people. I come from a very deprived area. Uh, there was a lot of poverty. You know, my, I seen a lot of domestic violence. Um, you know, I was quite desensitised to violence, really. I was dyslexic, so the school conventional environment wasn't right for me. Um, and you can't sit down and learn maths and English when you think that there's domestic violence going on at home. You know what I mean? You just, your mind's all over the place. So what happens is then you don't want to come home and I didn't want to go home. So my primary attachment shifted from my mom and, you know, my dad wasn't really around uh, much, but, you know, um, and then once my primary attachment shifted from my mum, it went to people who I thought cared about me. People who were selling drugs, night driving nice cars, uh, wearing nice clothes. And before you know it, they pull you into that kind of world. And that world, you know, the natural currency for that is violence. It's... Uh, scary because at first it's exciting and it's, it's glamorous to think, oh yeah, I'm hanging around with these guys and 
uh, being part of it. And then before you know it, you get pulled into crime. And then when I got pulled into crime, I seen, you know, people very close to me murdered. One of them, you know, was mur mur murdered in front of me, landed in my arms. I witnessed that. So when you go through trauma, right, them tra that trauma manifests into toxic behaviours, like risk-taking behaviour, self-harm, violent outbursts, you know, all various substance misuse. So you can go into all various different things. Um, and I started to do that and to, to, to fund that and to be able to make money and to be able to make legal money, started to sell drugs. And when you start to sell drugs, you naturally, you know, uh, start to carry weapons because that's the world you deal with. And unfortunately for me, um, you know, living in that world, I seen a lot of bad things and I didn't know how to deal with them. And I can remember one time I got arrested and somebody goes, do you want counselling? And I thought, I don't want to deal with Labour or Conservative. I didn't even know what counselling yeah. was, you know what I mean? So from there, I ended up boxing and boxing was great for me because it helped me self-medicate in a positive way rather than using substances. But then what really changed it for me is um, I got stabbed. I got stabbed by somebody and I was, I, was, I, was, I was dead for, you know, just under a minute and I got brought back and I thought, you know what, I've got to do something. Cut a long story short, you know, I went into volunteering. I had the challenge of trying to find employment, getting knocked back, isolated and ostracised from society. Um, and I was suicidal, you know. Um, and then what happened is I came, went back into college and then I... Uh, when and eventually got a job from volunteering, somebody put a good word in, and I got a job at a sports centre. And when I was at that sports centre, I was seeing young people like me that were really ostracised from society, coming from dysfunctional families, traumatised, absolutely ideal to be groomed into radicalisation or criminality. So I thought I got to create an environment to help them like an environment that saved me. And that's where I developed and I dissected my own pre past experience. I dissected the experiences of people who are no longer here, who are dead or in prison or still on substances or in dead end jobs. Baz, I've read that Switch Up has a five pillars model. What does that actually mean? So the first part is your hierarchy of needs. Have they got food? Have they got roof? Have they got someone to talk to? The next is your beliefs and perceptions, because if you believe that someone's going to upset you and you're going to stab them, because knives don't kill people, people kill people, you know. So if you actually believe that you can do that, then we've got to challenge them beliefs. And that's what we do. Then the third part is therapy and support. The fourth, the fourth part is skills and training. And then you place them in employment and help them become a law abiding taxpayer citizen because a lot of the time we went into crime because we couldn't we couldn't find a job nobody would give us a job and we couldn't make money to put food on the table so that's what the story is in a nutshell but i, I could I go mean, on honestly pages. like first of all what an amazing story yeah absolute big up man that was inspirational like so glad that people like you are upon this earth um i wanted to ask you a question and maybe john you could also help me answer this like you know i think sometimes with with issues like this, people want to see a result immediately, right? But, you know, what um, Baz was describing there, that's like a really long time you're with each one of those cases, right? So how long can it, will it be or do we expect to see the change? I think it depends what change we're looking for. Like, we're all work in progress, aren't we, right? I mean, you know, it takes, how long did it take me to start getting into, you know, fitness? About a decade, right? Yeah. How long did it take me to learn math? Like, you know, we all take time to get where we're going in life. Most of us never get where we're going. But you can do things that within six months can reduce the likelihood someone's going to carry a knife or someone's going to use a knife. Um, proper, high-quality mentoring. A lot of the children that Baz is working with that I'm worried about, they don't have adults who they trust. They don't have... So where are they getting their advice from? They're getting their advice from other children. Ch I've got children. They're rubbish at advice. <laughs> like, you know, we need, they need adults. And you can see a change um, that could save a life within a few months. But we need to keep working and supporting children, just as all of us as parents know. Yeah. Baz, what do you think? Okay, just to answer your question, I think that that's exactly what we need to be looking at because, you know, you can't just 
say someone's going to change in three months, you know, because when we bring people in and they're referred to us through statutory organisations, we'll do an assessment with them, we'll do an inf information gathering process, and then we'll look at their complex needs and traumas, you know, whether it's really ingrained traumas. We know we're seeing a lot of uh, the results now, the chickens are kind of coming home to roost from the time when kids were having kids and them kids were then being traumatised because the parents weren't, you know, ready to kind of bring them up. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that now. And I'm what, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there's some people that have been with us for over three years and they're just getting there, you know. Um, and some people might just go through the programme within three months and completely transition and actually get into work and, 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 and keep that. So I think we need to develop programmes that can work with that individual. Otherwise, what we're doing is taking them to a halfway point and then dropping them off a cliff again, you know. So, and that can kind of re-traumatise people as well. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of services are doing that. They're putting a service that is one shoe fits all, where you might catch a, quite a few people and help quite a few people, which is great. But if you really want to help people, we need to not just look at the symptoms, but really address the root issues. Right. And I mean, look, we're a politics podcast. Like something we're always thinking about is like, where, where is politics place in this? Like, isn't there an argument to say that also as part of our work, we should be trying to clamp down on poverty, trying to improve domestic violence services so that children don't have to live in homes like that. You know, it's all kind of joined up. I know both of you have experience actually working with politicians. Why has this taken so long yeah, to get I, off the ground? The Glasgow model has been sort of around for quite a few years now. Where, why has there not necessarily been more of a will to roll something yeah. out that we can show works. So when you when you last voted, what issues were you thinking about? And I think a lot of people, a lot of us don't think enough about the fact that you can seriously reduce violence. Yeah. Like we I, we sort of think oh, it's just there. It's just the way it is. That's just the way it's just not. <laughs> so if you go back uh 20 years, violence was almost double the level that it is now. Violence falls. We yeah. can bring it down. So first of all, the public, we, those of us listening, this can change. I believe it can change. And vote on the basis of who can change it. That will start to change things. The second thing is a lot of people uh, in power uh, don't have this as their number one priority. And yeah. I sympathise with some of that. So look, big thing we need to do, therapy. Children who are arrested, who are likely to commit violence, need therapy. Where, who has the budget for therapy? It's the health secretary. Is reducing knife crime the number one priority of a health secretary? No. <laughs> but we've got to somehow get it higher up the list. So that's the second thing. It's not always people's priority. The third and final thing is sometimes the solutions aren't things people expect. So some right. of us are like predisposed to all I want to hear about is enforcement and how you're going to rest your mm. way. Some of us want to hear, all I want to hear about is soft kindness and trauma informed training. That's all I want to hear about. The truth is you kind of need a bit of both. And actually you need to make sure we're really providing great mentoring, great therapy, but also putting police in the right places being properly trained matters. <laughs> and most people will say to me, John, I love half of what you say, but I don't like the other half. Right. But the truth is we do need a bit of both. And sometimes that stops it being taken on board by people who really care about this stuff. Baz, can I ask you, I mean, you know, you talked about your own experience with the police and I'm sure some of the cases you deal with have experiences with the police. What do you feel the police's role needs to be in this? I could imagine that the resistance from some sections of the public would say, yeah, but... We, as victims, don't we have a right to see, uh, to see punishments, to see imprisonment, to see these things, or is that just circulating, perpetuating the violence? I think this issue is a lot bigger than what you're what you're talking about. I think it, you know, when you come down to politics, right? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of this sits with them. Look at all the the youth service cuts. They say we need to get kids off the street, but where do you take them? You know, uh, cams. For, for young people, therapy, what John's talking about, you know, two years waiting list. Families are absolutely distraught. The cost of living crisis, the the fact that, you know, people were being abused in households during the pandemic and couldn't ask for help because they were locked down are coming out now and there's a whole can of worms coming out, you know. So when you're starting to look at this, right, the bigger picture is, OK, we're going to be putting people in prison. But what happens is a big waiting list, right? So one of the things is that 
people are waiting for a couple of years just to be heard. You know, the judicial system is congested. So that's then affecting people's mental health. I've known people committing suicide because they don't know whether they're being locked up or they're going to be spending time with their families, what's going to happen. And it's been going on and on and on. Then you then you go into prisons, right? And we need to look at the rehabilitation structure within prison. And then we need to look at the resettlement structure when they come out of prison, how we reintegrate them back into um, into into their communities and back into employment. That's a big segment that's missing. A lot of people are being released and coming out of prison. They haven't even got a home to go to. So what are they going to do? They're going to turn back to reoffending again. You know, short-term prison sentences is another thing. You know, you've got somebody who's got a job, who um, has um, got a house. They, they might go in for six months. They lose their job. They lose their house. During the pandemic, you're locked up for 23 hours. So they start using substances just to get some sort of sanity in this little room. And then they come out jobless, homeless and hooked on substances. So there's a bigger issue to think about. And going back to your point about police, I think police need to take a balanced approach. Like John says, you know, there has to be some uh, arrests and, and sending people to prison, but with a better rehabilitation structure there. But also they've got to do that prevention and early intervention and bringing and making cultural relationships, looking at that cultural competency in, in making relationships with diverse communities and actually being a role model, being some, some, some sort of organisation that, young people like us don't look at and get traumatised by, you know what I mean? That they've just kicked down our, our doors and they've just stomped through the house and hurt dad or something like that. Yeah. You know, we've got to look at the whole bigger picture. Can I give you a really practical thing, just building on Bez's point? Yeah. So, like, most people will vote for something called a police and crime commissioner. And if we're honest, how many of us actually know what the name of our police and crime commissioner is? I'm not sure I do, no. right? And I work in this field. <laughs> right. When you get to vote next in that police and crime commissioner, what I'd love you, write a letter, write something to that person and say, ask them two questions. One, when a child gets arrested, what support do they get? Because we know those are the children who really need support. What support are you getting? Because these people have budgets to support those children. What support is being given? Secondly, do you make sure the police actually spend time and get to know people in the area where violence is high? Or do you just send them where counsellors, your local counsellors, make a load of noise? Because <laughs> they ought to be where they're needed. Two questions. Do you send police where they're needed? And do you actually get support to children who are arrested? That's something everyone could do. And the evidence is really clear that will make your neighbourhood safer. But it's just often not happening. So is this a uh, is this a communications problem? Is it a chicken and egg situation where there isn't enough political will because there isn't enough clarity about the fact that there are solutions to this and it isn't just about locking people up? Um, let's start with a bit we can control. Right. You know, none of us are politicians, so let's we're the public. So let's start there and let's demand of the politicians that they do the stuff that works. And what do I mean? I just mean saying this: we don't want to be tough on crime. We don't want to be stuffed on crime. We want to be smart on crime. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we want. And then someone goes, oh, it's very complicated. It sounds very complicated. Okay, let me make it simple. Mentoring works. Is there mentoring for every child who's been arrested in this country? No. Therapy works. <laughs> Is there therapy offered for every child who's had a properly traumatic, abusive experience in this country? No. <laughs> Putting police in the areas where they're really needed and to get to know local people works. Is it happening? No. Three things. We could all ask for those things. And they're based on the evidence. But I don't go to hospital and go, I want the tough medicine. <laughs> oh, I prefer the soft medicine. <laughs> yeah. We go, I can't like the medicine that works. <laughs> yeah. And let's ask for the same thing when it comes to keeping our neighbourhood safe. Yeah. I just want to quickly say, like, first of all, thank you both so much for joining us. It does sound like there's a lot of shared aims um, between the two of you and shared senses of how those approaches can work. W is there scope for you, for both your organisations to be working together in the next few years? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I um, we give our money, so I'm always got to be really careful about suddenly <laughs> sort of seem to be doing a deal. But I, I hope that Paz will always apply for funding from us. And I know we've funded before. But more than that, like my organisation needs to learn. And people like Baz teach us, like they tell us what goes on on the ground. So I'm in, so I'm in debt to thanks him. For, thanks for sorting that deal out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time for our heroes and villains. And we are reverting back to type uh, this week with Coco, 
being all sunshine and optimism and revealing the hero of the week and me exposing my cold, dark heart to the listenership. <laughs> so I'll start. Uh, my villain of the week is the post office. Now, the post office is not already... The band. Not the <laughs> Oh, no, wait, that's not a band. That's a different... Postal service. Sorry, sorry. You, what you've done is you've translated the name of the American indie band <laughs> yeah. into their English equivalent, yeah. the post yeah, office. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, that happens. <laughs> These things happen. It's what happens when you work for an American brand. Yeah, that's I right. I blame them. I yeah. blame Crooked Media anyway. <laughs> yeah. For our American listeners, the band The Postal Service, to be clear, is not referred to as the post office <laughs> in the United Kingdom. That is something that Coco's brain has done. <laughs> it would be so good though, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, the, my villain of the week is the post office. Now, again, for American listeners, this might seem unfathomable, but I don't know how to summarise this other than to say, it turns out the post office is racist. So they're already up there uh, as one of the villains of the White last... envelopes, brown envelopes, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm obviously joking. I would, based on the actual story, I would love for the entire thing to be white envelopes and brown envelopes. <laughs> for context, they're already up there as some of the villains of the decade over the Horizon computing system scandal for which uh, hundreds of innocent sub-postmasters were prosecuted for stealing. So not only are they responsible for a miscarriage of justice... But also this week, it's been revealed that the investigators that were working on that case were asked to group suspects based on racial features. Oh, my goodness. They oh, my God. Organising suspects, which, let's be clear, in a case that turned out to be a huge miscarriage of justice. And they were doing it along the lines of racial features. So uh, the Freedom of Information request has revealed that an internal document published between 2008 and 2011 included the term Negroid oh. types along with Chinese slash Japanese types and dark-skinned European types. That is some Victorian-era oh, wow. steam-powered racism. I, I genuinely can't even believe that those terms are still in use. It... it, it it's absolutely unfathomable. Wow. So just to be clear, uh, this is a part of our uh, uh, legal responsibilities. Uh, the post office has said that it was a historic document. That's what they've said, a historic document. But it, by historic document, they don't mean it was written on a scroll of parchment from the 16th century. They mean it was a historic document from 2008 to 2011. That is not acceptable. It, 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 absolutely, that is unacceptable. You can't be like, oh, it was ages ago. It was so long ago. The first Iron Man film had just come out. It was a completely different time. <laughs> the post office could absolutely go fucking post itself off its own ass. <laughs> Awful. So on to something a little bit cheerier. I'm on to Hero of the Week. Um, I have a hero called Henry Morris, a parody Twitter account. He is the secret Tory. Yeah, Ben, it's Henry. You'll never guess what I just saw. No, not Eamon Holmes. I haven't seen him since Beefy's last dogging session in Epping Forest. Yeah, no, excellent. No, Michael Gove. Yeah, really. No, 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 no. There's no way I could have known I'm the Henry Morris who's been amateurishly lampooning his party's proto-fascist antics. So... As you know, there's a number of uh, Twitter accounts that have turned into books, Secret Barrister, Secret Footballer. And so when the Secret Tory uh, account arrived online, many people thought that it was indeed a Secret Tory. But plot twist, it was not. It was a parody account. It was Henry Morris. Um, he is a personal trainer and ultra marathon runner. He's from Yorkshire and he's got a spectacular mullet. It really is the definition of business at the front, party at the back. <laughs> Here at Pod Save the UK, we can only salute a man who says that it all started because, and I quote, I inadvertently started parodying Marc Francois at the height of Brexit when I was bored between training clients in my gym. End quote. Uh, he also adds other people discover they're good at things like ballet or dance, but it turns out I'm really good at pretending to be a Tory MP. Uh, so <laughs> thank you to him for bringing lots of levity and light to the political space, and we all know we need it. And actually, he's pretty, yeah, you know, some some of those uh, parodies were very on point. <laughs> Okay, uh, now we've got some uh, news of an exciting new element to the podcast. We are offering our services, aren't we, Coco, to be your political agony aunt and uncle. I'm actually feeling very triggered by this. Why? Well, because I'm, I consider myself too young to be an auntie. I've got terrible news for you, Coco. You and I are South Asians in our late 30s. We've gone into full no! Asian uncle and aunt no, no, territory. No, no, <laughs> no. All those people we called uncles and aunties, whether they were uncles and aunties or not, 
when we were kids were our age now. Well, that was a different time. <laughs> <laughs> that was a different time. It was say- 2008. <laughs> Iron Man was out. It was a different time. I'm not really ready to be... Auntie Coco. I'm literally about to become an uncle. Oh, really? In, in a in a matter of days. Okay. So uh, I'm 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 fully making that transition. Okay, Uncle Nish, he is. <laughs> what do, what does Uncle Nish bring? Samosas. What, what Uncle Nish? Good vibes, bad advice. What Uncle Nish brings is a lot of uh, good advice based on bad decisions. <laughs> Well, anyway, how bad could it possibly be? So please do write in with any political-related dilemmas, problems, conundrums, and uh, Auntie Coco and Uncle Nish will try and offer up some advice. So we've actually had our first conundrum from Ava. So she writes to say, I've been listening to the podcast and I thought you might be able to help me convince my friends to vote when they are able to. I'm 17, I'm a born and bred Scouser. Our city is famously anti-conservative and generally quite passionate about politics, especially local politics. This is why I was shocked when my friends confessed they wouldn't vote and that their parents don't vote either. I need your help because I seem to be unable to change their minds on the importance of voting, especially in local elections. It takes one look to see what damage was done to our city in the 80s by she who shall not be named, (laughs) she who shares a name with a cider brand, (laughs) and the underfunding as a result of our poorly elected governments that is still a symptom of our suffering today. Would you be able to give us some advice on how I could change their mind? Okay, Uncle Nish, you first. Well, first of all, Ava, thank you so much for writing in and thanks for, thanks for listening. I'm thrilled that we're, uh, we've got Gen Z listeners. Yes. Oh, my God. It's <laughs> so exciting. Um, listen. Are I we th- gonna, this is going to be so how do you do fellow kids this moment now, isn't it? I can feel it in oh, my no, waters. I'm not even going to attempt. <laughs> I, no one needs okay. to hear me malappropriate slang from TikTok. Like that's the <laughs> absolute last thing anyone needs. The thing that I would say, Ava, the a thing that I would I always say to people uh, who are younger than me, but also a lot of people my age who are feeling apathetic about politics is the problem in this country is that there are a lot of issues like uh, taxation of rich people, uh, rights for LGBTQIA people, women's rights, ethnic minority rights. Um, there's a huge number of issues that the majority of the public sit on the progressive side of, I would say. However, that doesn't tend to get reflected in the way that our parties govern themselves. And part of the reason for that is the people who vote are generally older And generally, a group of people that have somewhat swung a bit more conservative, right? And so because of that, there is a kind of sense that a very small number of people are dictating the entire tone of political conversations in this country because they are seen to be the only group that matters. So this country has basically drifted into becoming a a gerontocracy, like a country specifically run for old people, and a lot of whom share similar values. Not even like cool old people, like the bloke from Glastonbury. I'm talking about the angry old Daily Mail readers. And the reason that things have shifted in that direction is they turn out to vote. So if you want to change policy, we have got to start turning out to vote. People our age and people your age, Ava, have got to start turning out to vote and make ourselves into a significant electoral block and force the political parties to tailor policies to our generation's values and our generation's interests. We've got to make ourselves, and I'm speaking for basically everyone 40 and downwards, we've got to make ourselves matter to these people. And the way we do that is by voting. We can change things if we participate and we force them to pay some fucking attention to us. And if you successfully get your mates to do it, Nish will do you a cameo. Yeah, I will. Yeah, that's (laughs) right. Bribery. I don't know. I'm not sure how much a cameo from me is going to mean. I mean, Ava is from Liverpool, so we could maybe try and blur it so it looks like I'm Mo Salah, but I don't think otherwise that's going to be oh particularly God, meaningful. Oh my God, what an awful cameo moment being like, oh, look, it's Mo Salah. Oh, oh it's no, it's on. not. <laughs> it's that man. Yeah. It's that man again. Um, please do get in touch with us by emailing psuk at reducedlistening.co.uk or you can even send us a voice note on WhatsApp if that's the thing you like to do. Our number is 07514644572. Internationally, that's plus 447514644572. I hope one day they invest in a phone number that's catchier. <laughs> I really what want it, I don't know. I want it to be like... 
07800 PSUK. Do you know what I mean? I want it to be like a good number. We don't, we don't have those letter phone numbers in this country. That's specifically American. What are you on about, mate? If you open your keypad on your mobile phone, it's got the letters above the numbers. I know, but we never... Do we ever give numbers out like that? Well, don't use we. I give numbers out like that. You give numbers out like letters? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Wow. <laughs> I know. You were born to work for an American company. <laughs> But on the subject of uh, voice notes, Matthew in York is threatening to send us one. And he says, Hi, Nish and Coco, is it appropriate to use this number to send a voice memo of a whole minute of screaming into the void uh, in response to everything that's going on to this country? Cheers! Listen, if that's what you need to do, Matthew, then go for it. If you need to scream into the void, then by all means. And I say that confidently as the person who is not in charge of listening to the WhatsApp voice memos. I say that confidently, knowing it's going to be one of our long-suffering producers who's going to have to open a week's worth of people just yelling and screaming. I imagine a blizzard of obscenities oh into God, the WhatsApp. Oh my God, maybe we can make something from it. We can do like a montage of screams. Do you want to do be... a dance mix of people oh screaming God, into can, the void? We can do it so, to, so it's like to imagine, you know, like they did in the pandemic. <laughs> imagine that viral video the celebrities well, the video that immediately made everyone <laughs> immediately angrier but, um, the one video that somehow made the pandemic worse yeah but imagine it but with screams <laughs> just think that's really fitting anyway whatever please uh sign me onto your record labels i have great ideas um if you are new to the show though remember to hit follow on your app and you'll get every new episode every week as soon as it drops thanks matthew and thanks ava for contacting us we'll see you next week Pod Save the UK is a reduced listening production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by David Kaplowitz and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. And thanks to our engineer, DJ David Degahi. The executive producers are Louise Cotton, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer. Watch us on the Pod Save the World YouTube, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Pod Save the UK. And hit subscribe for new shows every Thursday on Spotify, Amazon or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts.